headlines make fans of Zack Snyder's films out to be toxic people who exude reprehensible behavior and have set a dangerous precedent for the film industry. But that just hasn't been my experience. It's sometimes hard to really enjoy these Zack Snyder DC films because they get clapped on a lot. So it's fun to be around other like-minded people who love these films. They're all people of high quality taste in film. I've found that fans of Snyder's work can be thoughtful and insightful and chatting with them provides me with different perspectives that elevate my own personal viewing of the stories. Since I've already shared why I love the cinematic style of Zack Snyder, I wanted to highlight other fans to hear what they love about the work of the visionary filmmaker. Dave, we've known each other for quite some time now. Uh, Mm -hmm. I cannot remember exactly when we met. Yeah, I I, I can't remember. It's been... I I would say well over five years. Yeah, it's it's been a while. And uh, we... Uh, we podcasted together. You've mm-hmm. been on Supergirl Radio, oh, yeah. and uh, so we uh, we talk a lot about DC characters and uh, Zack Snyder films and and films in general, and uh, and even television. I think we sort of maybe uh, talked about television as well with uh, Supergirl and the and the Arrowverse. Um, so we've uh, talked a lot about uh, art, I would say, and <laughs> the art of storytelling, and um, and in terms of film. I'm always curious about like where people found out that they were interested in film, in movies. Do you remember like your first movie that you saw that you were like, wow? Or do you even remember like the first movie you saw? The first, I would say it was probably either Empire Strikes Back or um, Superman the movie. And this is probably uh, on home video or HBO or something like that. And um I think the John Williams score of both those films is incredible. The music touched me. The visuals were incredible at the time. Um, Star Wars, you know, was, was, I think that's probably some form of a Star Wars movie is probably on everyone's <laughs> um, list of some kind of inspiration. You know, I know there's varying degrees of it, but um, as far as in the movie, and I've thought about this in the actual theater, I've thought about this so hard and I I believe it was back to the future, although it must have been some kind of re-release because I was only probably about five or six um, when that was going on. And I think I snuck in with my brother, my brother, who's a good bit older than me, (laughs) um, took me with him. And of course, I loved it. And, you know, I don't know, the 80s were like a magical time. Um, for movies, you had you had block. Well, I don't know about Blockbuster, but I certainly remember like home video. We would go rent like VHS constantly, or there was a place called Little Henry's that we would go to and get get movies constantly. But as far as in theater, it was probably Back to the Future. I know I saw Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure <laughs> um, at some point too, and then probably in high school, uh, middle school, high school, I started. I, I was really good friends with my friend Rafe um, ever since kindergarten, but we really got really close uh, and started watching like seriously watching film uh we would go rent movies and watch them like oh have you seen the godfather and i'm like what's the godfather you know stuff like that that i would have probably never been exposed to at my house And it's not because my dad didn't um like good movies it's just you know if it wasn't on tbs or like um you know something at home we probably weren't going to do a lot of it you know i do remember going to see batman with tim burton that was a huge deal that's probably the first movie I remember seeing like three or four times in the theater. And, you know, that was uh, obviously a huge influence and and all that on me. I've loved film as far as movies and stuff has been a part of my life since I can remember, you know, even back to, you know, animated movies, you know, Transformers, the movie with Optimus Prime dying, you know, stuff like that was a huge deal when it came out. Masters of the Universe, which, you know critically panned and all i loved it and i went to see it and loved it you're giving me a lot of ideas that i would like to pursue for a series on my youtube channel and if you would want to do it with me i would be interested because i love back to the future Mm -hmm. i never get to talk about it really with anybody it's probably in my opinion the greatest film trilogy of all time and that's saying a lot because i love the dark knight trilogy i love zack snyder's trilogy um, and there are some great trilogies out there, but Back to the Future is just, you know, chef, a, chef's kiss. 
Yeah, I mean, the first movie to me, and I've heard Quentin Tarantino say this. I've heard other, you know, big filmmakers say this. It's like a perfect movie almost. If, yeah. if such a thing exists, you know. <laughs> there's, it, there's, oh, it, oh, it does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so there's some, you know, there's, there's probably criticism on little things here or there. You can always find something, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about later what we think about, you know, people judging these things and stuff. Yes. But, but you know that's that's one of those things where I do think it's anytime it's on I gotta watch a little bit of it. You know I don't I don't know that I always sit down and watch the whole thing, but I watch 20, 30 minutes of it, and my wife's like, "We just saw this the other week." You know, <laughs> like her like her favorite movie that comes on all the time is a Few Good Men, which is also a really oh, good yeah. movie. You Great know, movie. really yeah. good movie. So like I tease her back, like, "Oh yeah, we watching this again." Huh? <laughs> yeah, so. That's Stuff amazing, like that. and mm -hmm. also the Masters of the Universe. Mm -hmm. I have not seen it in a very, very long time, but I oh, used yeah. to watch the heck out of it when I was a kid. And all I really remember about the movie is the little like troll guy. Yeah. The guy yeah. with the like the weapon thing. I don't Hold really over. know. I, I don't really remember what he did, but I just that's the image I think of is that little character from Masters of the Universe. And it's, I I watched that a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. It, it's funny that character. Kevin Smith's been doing the Master Universe uh, animated show on Netflix the last oh, really? couple of seasons. Oh, and he yeah, brought yeah, that... no, no, I, I did know about that because uh, Melissa Benoist and Chris Wood. Yeah, are, yeah, they were are, they were in yeah. it in the last Chris, season, Chris and, Wood and is they brought -Man. yes, yes, yeah, and they brought that character you're talking about. They brought him <gasps> into the mythology. Really? Now it's you know it's a separate kind of thing, but it's. I guess they were like, he wants to play with all these toys. He's like, all right, I'm going to bring this in, you know, from the movie. And I'm going <laughs> to, you know, that kind of thing. So I thought that was really cool because he, he, Gildor was one of my favorites too, as well. I mean, those little characters like that, that were like Yoda or Gildor or Willow or like, they were always kind of like, you know, they were little, little sneaky up to no good kind of thing, but they were also obviously heroes and stuff too oh but, yeah i mean brave um, and um mm -hmm. courageous when they needed to be and mm -hmm. it's so interesting that you mentioned uh the 1980s i grew up in the 1980s i don't want to date myself but i am very old i will say that um uh in my mind i'm very old i, think, I was gonna say i think i got you by your <laughs> a couple of years i'm i might be pretty old uh, to some <laughs> to some people but when i was growing up the movies were amazing. Like you, mm -hmm. you all the time. There were these. I mean, like, like the Goonies. Um, E.T. is a great movie. It scares the crap out of me, but it's an excellent yeah. film. Mm -hmm. Um, and and there were so many. Uh, all those Indiana Jones movies. Just the, almost like hit after hit after hit in the eighties. Just you could not. I still think you cannot beat the movies of the nineteen eighties. They're classic. I agree. They were churning them out. They were all adventurous. And I remember, uh, I'll have to see if I can find it, but they're, speaking of Quentin Tarantino, he talked about how, um, you know, the 80s movies were so good and that he's hoping that there's like a sort of a, a circular thing that goes back, or, you know, kind of the cinematic evolution is going to circle back around to those, you know, kind of that feel of the 1980s in terms of uh, cinema. So I hope... I hope maybe it gets there because when I think of 80s movies, I think of adventure, even like Back to the Future mm -hmm. um, that was in the 1980s. Those in my I guess they're sci fi. I mean, they're time travel. But oh, yeah, but uh, they send me on a, an adventure like I'm going somewhere. I'm doing something new I've never done. I'm meeting these new characters and doing these things you know, going to the wild west and, uh, you know, <laughs> time traveling with the train, you know, right, those, yeah. those kinds of things I think are so unique. There weren't a lot of sequels. Uh, right. there weren't a lot of like, they were film franchises, but they were all like those Indiana Jones movies even are each a little different. Um, yes. so, uh, so I, I would echo your sentiment that the, uh, well, okay. So the 1940s also had some great films. Oh yeah. But yeah. The 1980s, that is that is the sweet spot for me. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's it's, yeah. it's definitely the sweet spot for like sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, you know, adventure. Yeah, I mean, I think the 70s um, were a little more gritty, a little uh, more. Um, yeah. Uh, tra uh, uh, what do they call them? Um, the disaster films. Yeah, the disaster so, films. A lot of those. You know, the street level crime movies, stuff like that. But I think the 80s just gave birth to just this. And and maybe it was Star Wars, you know. I don't know. I I just think that there was an explosion of science fiction and ideas, and 
or I and mean, even action action movies. Yeah, okay, action maybe. movies. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was I was thinking the other day. I watched about the last half of Flash Gordon, and I watched it so many times as a kid. I mean, like. I, I've probably watched that film maybe more. I don't know if I've watched it more than Back to the Future, but it's one of those movies I've watched so much because as a kid, it was like it was kind of like having another Star Wars. At the time, I didn't know that it was it was cheesy and it was trying to be cheesy, right? Like that's what you find <laughs> out later is the director was in on the joke, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So many people criticized it for being corny and cheesy, but that he was going for camp. That's yeah, what he was yeah. going for. Long story short, I got to meet uh, the guy that played Flash Gordon a couple of years ago, and it, cool. like, it was incredible. It was like <laughs> probably the biggest excitement I've had of meeting a star in one of these things ever. And he, like, I, he put his arm around me, and he was all buddy buddy with me, That's and we were cool. taking a picture, and he just goes, "Flash Gordon." <laughs> like that and i was like this is awesome it's so awesome like he just he was everything i wanted him to be so that's that's great <clears throat> i'm glad to hear a very positive experience like that. yeah that yeah. is amazing i was even thinking like you mentioned flash gordon i was thinking mm -hmm. about um the last starfighter oh I incredible movie love yep. the last starfighter that's one of those movies that i think about when i think of like adventure and space and mm -hmm. um science fiction and fantasy well it's not exactly well it's kind of fantasy but um a little bit yeah uh, but uh, that movie, uh, I think the reason why it's never been remade is because the guy who like made it was like, you will never remake this. Right. Like, yeah. I will not let you do this. Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale were like, yeah, with Back to the, the future. future, too. Yeah. So I think more filmmakers need to do that where they're like, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, no. you know, it's it's and I'm not saying some of the remakes. I mean, we're probably going to talk about one shortly that I thought was incredible. But yeah. Just the idea is is what can you do to possibly make this one better or add to it? It's like you hear, well, oh, they remade Roadhouse recently, and I haven't watched the new one, but like, why would you remake that? What are you what are you doing that's different? Or what are you capturing that, you know, years of this playing on television and building up in people's minds as this thing? Uh, it, you know, it's it's what are you going to do that could possibly top whatever somebody's expectation is? I think we are kind of in a weird place with film. There's tons of IP sequels coming out. There's remakes coming out. I mean, like it's I want to see something. Show me something new, you know? Yeah, that's that's what's refreshing about Rebel Moon. I mean, like people can, you know, it's derivative and all that. Everything's derivative, you know, sure. and, yeah. and I'm sure we'll get into this more, but I think it's cool that he's trying something extremely wild, you know, yeah, he's, yeah. he's, he's trying to hit a grand slam. When I think of Rebel Moon, I think of kind of that action adventure mm -hmm. 80s kind of feel. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think there's, uh, I think there's something that excites me about that because it's like, all right, Let's go. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go on this trip. I'll I'll go on this uh this adventure with you. Um. So yeah, I I I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And also, I think you also alluded to Dawn of the Dead. So I'm gonna use that as a segue to uh. So we're we're gonna talk about um Zack Snyder as a whole as a filmmaker, and then maybe we'll get into his DC stuff. So if you are gonna like pick your favorite Zack Snyder movie. Out of his non-DC stuff, which favorite one would you pick? This is including Watchmen, I guess, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. well. Okay, we can include it. We uh, can include it in it, DC. It, it is a DC property, but it's not his DC trilogy. Okay. So I guess we can include it in the non-DC section. Okay. So in a in a way, I think Watchmen is his like Magnus Opus kind of thing. Like it's incredibly like one of the most incredible films visually i've ever watched down to the drops of rain that come down and mm. scenes it seems to have gained kind of some cult status along the years christopher nolan said something very interesting a few months back about it being ahead of its time and i think oh, it absolutely think was absolutely right the genius and i'll call it genius of, of snyder was on full display and firing on all cylinders at that moment but oh, we're in, in those many moments of that movie. <laughs> so I, I just I feel like that to me is probably the one, especially visually, that I would point someone to and say, this is what this guy can do. And, you know, make something as close to the source material as he did, where you almost feel like it, you're watching the comic book be turned. Mm. And I know there's some changes to it and all that. But, you know, the point being is that the man obviously has a style 
and maybe it was popularized with 300 or something like that and tremendous movie too oh yeah uh, but i just feel like watchman to me is the one that i go back to in my mind when i'm thinking about him as a filmmaker that's probably the one i would pull off the shelf and open up and say hey you want to check out snyder let's check him out you know that film is uh it, I think it was the first Zack Snyder film that I saw. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had read the graphic novel before I went to go see it. And even before like the trailers came out, I had finished reading it. My, my friend, Mike, who you've met, yeah, Mike. Um, uh, we, we actually did a panel about Watchmen yeah. at Atlanta comic con one year. Uh, people can watch it or, or listen to it. I can't remember. It's audio only, uh, but it's on my YouTube channel. So if you can check it out, you can check it out. Uh, maybe I'll link it in the video description below. Very if, good. Uh, yeah. This later. The first trailer that came out, I was like, my eyes got really bad. I, mean, I have big eyes anyway, but I'm sure my eyes got really big when I was watching that because I was like, it looks just like, like the book. Like I yeah. recognize all of that stuff. And um, so I think his his attention to detail, like you said, and the the choices made behind it in terms of like the coloring is trying to mimic the colors of the book and um, uh, the way everything is just so um, intentional about the the character choices and the the way they use the camera. And even I know it has a lot of slow motion, but even the slow motion is very intentional. I go back and forth between Watchmen and BBS being his best film. Mm. I, I like fight it with myself because mm. BBS is obviously a, a big, uh, meaningful part of my heart. But sure. Watch, Watchmen is truly like one of the cinematic masterpieces. It's unreal what he was able to do in that movie. You know, and I know he has casting directors and stuff like that, that work with him, but um, as we know, the director's the boss. So I'm going to give him and his crew a lot of credit in that the casting for his films is always amazing. No matter if I'm looking at something and think, mm, maybe that works a little bit or maybe it doesn't. But I just feel like the casting is just always on point. You know, it's not a it's not a happy story. You no. know, it's it's a very it's a very dark the end of the world, you know, yeah, nihilistic story, yeah. you know, and it and but there is some joy in there, especially when you get to with Alvin and all that, like all that stuff, you know, the love story there and even the friendship he had with Rorschach, which is mm. bizarre to say the least. I mean, <laughs> but there is a piece of me that's like, gosh, I wish there was like a 25 issue run of like adventures Just with their, these, their like, team buddy up. cop. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd read that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We sort of briefly talked about Dawn of the Dead. What are your what are mm -hmm. your thoughts on that? Because we talked about remakes and mm -hmm. sequels and things like that. So that was a remake. He mm -hmm. that was kind of his big first foray into sort of big budget filmmaking in Hollywood studios and things like right. that. What, what do you think about Dawn of the Dead? I love Dawn of the Dead. Um, I've never been like huge horror movie fan. I mean, there's certainly horror movies here and there that I've enjoyed Halloween. John Carpenter's Halloween is, I think, a, another one of these incredible films that was made with nothing. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. They, they had, like, nothing. And, like, you know, you hear the stories about the crews doing, like, two or three jobs and stuff like that in the film itself. And that kind of guerrilla filmmaking is always interesting to me. But I think the Dawn of the Dead, you know, the, the isolation in the mall – um the zombies that were running i mean was that a th was that a th was he the first to kind of do that or or had 28 days later come out yet those are the two that i remember being like these zombies are really really scary <laughs> they're not yeah. just like stumbling at you that's um, a good question i i don't uh know the timeline of that but i know yeah. that he um but Zack snyder has always tried to sort of break some of the the tropes of the especially the zombie genre right um, yeah. trying to sort of reinvent some things and um, tell something new with zombies, which I appreciate because I am not a zombie fan. I'm right. not even really a horror fan. When I was in high school and the Scream movies came out, I was like, mm -hmm. I love this because mm -hmm. I, I, I loved Scream because it was it was meta. It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't I, it was scary, but it wasn't like trying to scare you so much as it yeah. was trying to make a commentary on those scary right. movies. So yeah. I think uh, Scream sort of you know, eased me into it because I wasn't as scared as like interested in the the film commentary of it. But now as I'm older and very much aware of my mortality, I think I am not as interested in horror movies <laughs> as much. I've also um, uh, listened to a lot of exorcism podcasts, so I'm not really into that either. Um, so so horror movies are not for me. Um, but uh, I will watch a Zack Snyder zombie movie. That's one of the ones I watch on Halloween every year. Now, ah, my, nice. My uh, family, I have 
three girls in the house. I have a wife and two daughters. None of them like anything scary. <laughs> so I have to like come up here and, you know, <clears throat> watch my uh, Dawn of the Dead at that point. And Halloween, sometimes I'll throw that in for a double feature. But, you know, I, I do think he had something new to add. And we were talking about that earlier. And you were talking about kind of pushing how he pushes things to a point on every film he makes. And I do, I do feel like he does. And with this one, I mean, there's the baby scene and I know James Gunn helped him write this. So some credit where credits do also. Right. James Gunn with the screenplay. So I also feel like he does things with music that maybe some directors don't always do. I mean, the opening um, Dawn of the Dead with the man, uh, when the man comes around by Johnny, yeah, Johnny Cash. Cash. I mean, it's yeah. incredible. Like it's just chaotic. And it's it's such an incredible opening sequence. Then I'll jump ahead to like Army of the Dead. And they'd had an incredible opening sequence with the Las Vegas. And it was most of it was in slow-mo from what I remember. But it yeah. was it was just so powerful. Us, again, with Watchmen, you know, they're playing uh, Times They Are Changing. Bob oh, Dylan yeah. is like, it's, perfect. it's incredible. I mean, yeah. it's such a great opening. There's I haven't found anyone that thinks that opening's bad, no matter what else they think of the movie. Right. For me, it's like I can only imagine how he's constantly thinking about scenes, constantly thinking about s songs even, or like musical cues or like editing or, sh you know, shots or, you know, whatever it is. And it's fun to follow a filmmaker like that and watch him put his stamp on things i don't know if he like listens to music while he's storyboarding or something like like i don't know if he's doing that i know some filmmakers or writers will will do that they'll listen to music while they write mm -hmm. or something uh, but uh I, that's a that's a good question that somebody should yeah. ask him like how does he incorporate uh, the music, because I would agree that his music choices, even if it's not just like, you know, popular music, but he has music at the beginning, like a score at the beginning. One of the things that I love about a Zack Snyder film is that I, I don't think this was the case with Rebel Moon, but uh, the rest of his films, like he immerses you into the film just using music and visuals mm. and sound effects and things like that so that you're not bombarded with a lot of information you're just kind of like in there and you kind of get invited into the film right. and i've always really appreciated that and i i uh i wish more film filmmakers did that because it it sucks me in it makes me go oh i have to sit here and figure out what this is showing me right um, so even the music there i think in that in those cases is is very good so yeah yeah i think that's a really good point about um even down to his music choices is a uh, is something to is it kind of maybe one of his trademarks i would say you know you even look at man of steel the scene where he gets out of the water and he's trying to find like clothes and stuff and they're playing seasons by chris cornell that's my wife's favorite scene i have no idea why <laughs> it's a great uh, song <laughs> oh oh I, now i know why it's it's her favorite scene yes in ray cavill shirtless and yeah you know clothes. yes no and he, thank uh, god i look so much like him that it's like <laughs> So anyway, um, the Chris Cornell song Seasons, which is a song I've listened to since I was probably 12, 13 years old to hear that in that moment and like, oh, man, this is in a Superman movie. Like, that's kind of yeah. cool, you know? <laughs> yeah. So um, you're right. I mean, I think I think there's something to that. And I, I think his musical taste, if I'm basing it on what's in the films, is just very, very cool. I think that's something that doesn't get talked about enough is his uh, use of music and how he incorporates music to affect scenes and tell stories mm -hmm. and uh, enhance character. Um, so I think that's a really, really good point. Um, now, something we didn't talk about that I kind of want to get to, um, which which was the first Zack Snyder film that you saw? Was it Dawn of the Dead? It was probably Dawn of the Dead. Now, at the time, I didn't know that he had directed it. Obviously he was somewhat unknown. His name, uh, I think it became more prominent for me once he was making Watchmen. And I didn't, I probably didn't see Dawn of the Dead until I was um, about to go see Watchmen or maybe yeah. I saw Watchmen and then saw Dawn of the Dead brief. My, my buddy had the, uh, the DVD at that point. And so that's how I watched it first. I missed it on the theatrical run. It was within that little time when Watchmen was out that I watched both of those. I'll probably go out on a limb and say I probably watched Watchmen first just because of where my head was at the time with superheroes and stuff. I was probably like 
couldn't wait to see Watchmen on the screen, you know. Moving away from his non-DC trilogy, let's get into his DC trilogy. So mm -hmm. do you have a favorite film of the three of Man of Steel, BBS, and Zack Snyder's Justice League? Mm, it's tough. I'll probably say Man of Steel. BBS to me is right there with it. I was so upset when they said Batman was going to be in the second one <laughs> because I wanted a sequel to what I saw. Sure. But then I also got the sequel to what I saw in <laughs> yeah, you're BBS, right. Yes, you know, but I, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. I think Man of Steel, I probably went in with a little chip on my shoulder because I did. I was one of the few that enjoyed Superman Returns. I thought Brandon Ralph was just really good as Superman and I thought he deserved another chance as Superman. So I was like, man, this isn't, there was a little bit of me that was like, man, this isn't Brandon Ralph, you know, but I remember the few days before it came out that we were in Walmart and they had the Superman capes and my wife maybe put one on and she took a picture. And <laughs> for some reason I started kind of, man, we should go see that this weekend, you know? And my dad, you know, God rest his soul. He got to go with us to see it. Oh, good. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, once we saw it, my dad was like, that was really good. And I was like, yeah, it was, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like back to the future in a way. And that every time I watch it, I'm picking up something. Maybe I didn't notice or put emphasis on the last time I watched it. But I also kind of feel that way about BBS, especially, you know, not to toot your horn there, but after watching, you know, your coverage of BBS and talking to you about it as a friend too, has just been one of the great things I think about us connecting about this mm. kind of stuff. And of course, you know, justice league to me, I remember watching it for four hours and couldn't take my eyes away from it. The night it was released on max and I love it. Like I had a smile on my face the whole time <laughs> because I was so let down with what we had gotten. And then it felt like, you know, how many years later? Did, it was like two or three years later, right? Two uh, years later, I think. Four years. Uh, four years, Justice okay. Justice League came out in 2017 in the theaters. And then I mm -hmm. think Zack Snyder's Justice League came out March something, 2021? 2021. Yeah, that's yes. right. That's right. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Yeah. I think they announced it during COVID, but it uh, happened like a year later. When that comes out, it's just like, I was so disappointed by what we got. And then his name to still be on it. When I know it's like, that's... I'm watching it in the theater with my friend Chad, who, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like he had filmed 10% of what they were showing, and they still had him as director, and that probably bothered me more than anything else. I remember leading up to it, there was all these interviews like, oh, you know, Joss Whedon's going to, they're friends even. that You know, you were hearing like he was friends with Zack Snyder, and he was going to take Zack Snyder's vision and just shuffle some things around. and right get it the rest of it finished you know because Zack snyder and them had, had this unfortunate tragedy with his daughter and there was something leading up to it that i went in pretty skeptical notoriously the south Kinds fired Don richard donner as he was filming oh Superman yeah too. The history and, repeated itself right so the history you know there's a history of these things but as a kid i enjoyed superman too without knowing any of the drama and to be fair at that point i didn't love everything joss whedon had done but i was a fan of angel probably more so than buffy at it buffy was not something i super got into but I, angel was the one that kind of I was like really into and I thought there was talent there however it became pretty clear especially once mustache gate or whatever they called it at the time with Henry Cavill and the mustache uh, fiasco with the CGI I could just feel like they were just trying to get this thing out yeah by a certain time they didn't necessarily respect what Snyder had been doing and you know a lot of that I think was due to the backlash that was received critically for BBS, which I, th I mean, I guess we'll get into later, but yeah. you know, totally, I thought it was totally unfair. I those, still look those at critics got what they wanted though. <clears throat> they did. They wanted more fun. They wanted more color and they wanted Joss Whedon. So that's exactly what they got. You know, and it's so funny because like <laughs> I was, I mentioned Superman Returns earlier. I remember that I think it was after they decided to not go with Brian Singer in them that there was an executive at Warner Brothers that said, we're going to try to make Superman a little more darker, mm. a little more grounded in real world. And everybody was like, yeah, <laughs> because Superman is like wimpy, you know, because oh, let's see the Christian Bale Batman movies had kind of come out around the same time. And everybody was loving those. I think even though I 
think Superman Returns made more money than Batman Begins. You had them saying they were going to go darker with, and then when they do do something that's a little more dark, that's a little more grounded, people don't. People are like, "Wait, wait a minute, that's not." You know, it's like <laughs> that's this not what Superman. You, what are you? Yeah, doing? I was like, you guys were just talking about this is what you wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and now you don't. Which you know, surprise, surprise, Hollywood, right? I do think Man of Steel to me is probably the one. Going back to your original question, you know, about that stands out to me is probably my favorite. The Hans Zimmer score is just unreal. And I just, I just saw, you know, I just watched Dune part two. And again, the man is just incredible with his music. Anytime I listen to something with Hans Zimmer, it's, it's like he's, he's, you talk about adding something to something, Mm, mm -hmm. but with the Superman, I think his theme was incredible. The vulnerability in the music, the vulnerability that Henry Cavill shows that um, Amy Adams shows that, you know, you even get little scenes like where Perry's trying to rescue Jenny and they lock eyes and it's like, they know they're about to die yeah and perry has decided he's just gonna go down with her and it's 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 a little moment you know it's there's all this craziness going on around it but there's still these these like little human moments in there that are just really to be celebrated to me i really enjoyed seeing the krypton stuff i thought that was a unique take on krypton inspired by maybe a lot of different things but we were all used to the donnerverse krypton and people want man of steel to be more like comic book accurate superman and it's like well no it is like that krypton sequence is straight out of john burns man of steel absolutely comic book run i don't fault you for uh putting Man of Steel at at number one for you because it's a version of Superman that honors Superman Mm -hmm. in various incarnations, whether it be Christopher Reeves and Smallville, um, some of the comic book uh, stories uh, that it was uh, referencing, but it tried to do something different. And one of the things Mm -hmm. that I thought was so cool about it was that I, I saw an interview with Zack Snyder where he talked about how they, they made that movie as if they had just found a Superman comic book under like, like he found a Superman comic book under his bed and he picked it up and he was like, what is this? I want to make a movie about this. Wow. It's exactly (laughs) what that is like because they reinvented the Superman theme. They reinvented his suit. They reinvented even Lois Lane. They reinvented Mm -hmm. Lois Lane before Amy Adams is Lois Lane. People don't think about this, but she is the only Lois Lane who never had to deal with the triangle for two. Exactly. Never had yeah. to deal with like being uh, out of the joke, you know, out of the the loop about uh, the secret identity. She mm-hmm. she's there before the secret identity even gets formed, and she's in on it. Um, and uh, so that revolutionary for Lois Lane. Um, it, it really was. I, I I feel like too that again that goes back to. And I, you know, and I know there's a lot of people working with Snyder on this, Christopher Nolan, David Goyer. Right. Um, but they were all pushing this mythology, but still keeping it in line. Like yeah. it's, you know, let's push it to the edge, but not quite over the edge. You know what I mean? And I think that's that's what you have to do with some of these characters that you reinvent every now and then. We've seen it with Bond, with James Bond. You know, there's there's the reinvention with Daniel Craig famously. And, you know, we've seen it with Batman over the years. We've seen it with Sherlock Holmes. These characters that are timeless or, you know, can be timeless, but they can have different versions. But I do think you have to stay. There's the the meat and potatoes of it all that mm. you keep that meat and potatoes right there and you can do whatever with the dressing. You know what I mean? Amy Adams playing the Lois Lane that knows, I thought was such an incredible role of her to be able to figure this out and track this down. You got to see her being a great reporter. Um, you didn't always see that before. Um, there were episodes of Lois and Clark where you would see a little bit of that. You would see, you know, maybe a tad of it in like Superman in like Superman two or something at the beginning mm. with the, with the Paris bomb and stuff. I love seeing her be the investigative reporter. And I love seeing Clark do the same thing in, in Batman vs Superman. Oh yeah. I don't want to say it's a C story, but it's, it's part of the B story of that movie that Clark's on this hunt. You know, he's, he's interviewing these people, especially in the ultimate edition. I do feel like they fleshed all that out a little more in that to see these guys in action on the big screen as these really good investigative reporters was was great even though perry gave clark a bunch of crap about it i thought it was (laughs) i thought it was great and and gosh i mean lawrence fishburne oh yeah what a godsend is perry white the characters all felt familiar to me Mm. michael shannon is odd i mean i just you know everybody's like well terrence stamp terrence stamp and and 
Hey, I love Terrence Stamp as Zod. I truly do. But Michael Shannon is the one I think about now. When I think about Zod, like I, there's a Zod miniseries out right now by DC that um, at some point I might read. And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like thinking about Zod and I think about the Michael Shannon version, mm. you know. So there's so many things that I think, especially Man of Steel, burnt into my mind about Snyder's, you know, Snyder's trilogy is what we'll call it now, that I think I have to just I have to go with with man of steel yeah a man of steel is just it's so good for me it's like the the perfect superman movie yeah um so i don't fault you for that choice at all and like talking about man of steel with you makes me because i i've done a lot of i've done a big series about batman v superman Mm -hmm. and i've done some things about the snyder cut but i haven't really done anything for my youtube channel on man of steel i've over at Supergirl Radio, we have, but yeah, um, uh, but uh, for my personal YouTube channel, not so much. So uh, it makes me want to talk about Man of Steel more. So uh, maybe oh, I can I'll, I'll be I'll be watching if you do. Yeah, so. oh, I might I might rope you into it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, Man of Steel is just so good. I mm-hmm. I always tell the story, but like when when I was going through cancer treatment, uh, Man of Steel had just come out and it was already on uh, uh, DVD. I think. I think I had it only on DVD. I don't know if I had it Blu-ray at the time. Maybe I had Blu-ray at the time. Um, But I watched it, like, sometimes I couldn't sleep uh, when I was going through cancer treatment just for various things. You know, sometimes I would have issues where, like, I felt like the room was spinning and, you know, you know, like weird little things that happen during uh, cancer treatment. And um, I would pop that on and just let it run uh, so that it would help help me go to sleep and yeah. and i would i would uh just watch it every night just put pop it on because it was like it was like a comfort movie for yeah. me um so i have a real special attachment to me and of steel in that way so i i love it you're you're not going to find a bigger well you're you might be a bigger man of steel fan than me but i'm well, i'm right up there i'm like right you, underneath you you know the experience you've just described though i mean that makes me feel um that makes me feel connected in a way with with the fandom, you know, because <clears throat> it's hard to find someone that truly, truly enjoys the film without having a caveat, you know, like, oh, it's it was good up until. Oh, yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yeah. whatever the neck snapping or the, you know, whatever it is, the destruction of Metropolis. And it's like all of those choices. I'm not saying that I was like every time that I was on board with everything, but I think having watched it and it is a film to me, you can rewatch and watch and watch like you were talking about, especially in the situation you were talking about. But like, you know, there's so much now that I understand about what, what that I feel I understand about why uh, Superman had to make that choice with Zod and his reaction after her, after it sold the whole thing, you know, that he was, you know, he's alone now. He doesn't, there's n- None of his people are around now. He took a life. You know, there's there's so many things to peel back from that. And I like that it wasn't necessarily discussed. You know, yeah. it's something you have to kind of infer as a as a as a watcher. And it's such a brave move. I, you know, I'm sure I'll get I'm sure I'll get some crap for saying that, but it is to me. Well, a brave it is move. bold. I yeah, mean, bold. some some people would be like, Well, Superman would always find a way. Well, in some cases he might not be able to. That's no, just the and, reality of things. Yeah. Yeah. And if you and if you've seen it, you know, if you've read the comics, you know that there's situations where he's killed before. And, and it's where, usually Zod. Where Batman's killed. <laughs> yeah. And where Batman's killed before and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So that's a, you know, that's another thing when you talk about BBS, is I think about people talking about Batman killing people. And I'm like, man, Batman's been killing people on film at least as back as 1989. Oh yeah, Michael Keaton's Batman, just like I mean, he's killed people. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I was thinking about, um, I think you did a watch along with us in the old DC on DC podcast where we watched Batman Returns, or, or I don't know if we watched it or we maybe we just talked about it at the beginning when he's just like, you know, dropping bombs and blowing up <laughs> these circus clowns. Yeah. Were, you know, they were bad guys, <laughs> but it's just like. He he turns the Batmobile around at one point and just like shoots the fire onto that one guy and yeah it's not an accident like he's mm-hmm. intentionally trying yeah, to do that he's, like he's killing him <laughs> yeah you know. I love Batman Returns let's not yeah I remember that. you I, Batman I, Returns is amazing I remember you and Chad uh, loved it so much I I right. was you know I was kind of in between I kind of I I didn't um 
I didn't share you guys' love for it, but I I was appreciative of you guys' excitement for it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, much. yeah, um, yeah. Batman Returns is not for everybody, but <laughs> but I'm I'm that weird Tim Burton weird child that loved it. Um, I, I you said something that I thought was so interesting. This maybe is a good um uh segue into talking about film criticism. But you said I, I can't remember now. I'll have to paraphrase what you said. But you said something just like um that you were able to just watch a movie and enjoy it mm -hmm. like without having a caveat of uh you know oh it could have been executed mm -hmm. better here mm -hmm. and i thought you know sometimes it is nice to just watch a movie and be like okay yeah. i enjoyed that maybe you know maybe you could go into the analysis of it and be like well it wasn't as strong here sure but but some but sometimes it's like it's nice to just you know like with with uh superman snapping zod's neck Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have Superman do that. Right. Yeah, maybe, I wouldn't have. May, maybe that would not have been my choice. Mm -hmm. But it happens in the movie and it's well done. And I, I, I remember exactly when I saw it for the first time. I remember the, the neck snaps and I and I thought to myself, oh, no, people are going to hate this. <laughs> I said that to myself. I said, people are going to hate this. And the moment that he like yells that big yell, mm -hmm. I like it like calmed my spirit because yeah. I was like, Oh, there's Superman. That's yeah. that's Superman. He felt horribly about it. And so it made it easy for me, but there are some people who did not get past the, Oh, I hate this. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think the idea of just being able to consume something and be able to just be like, ah, I enjoyed yeah, a movie. How exactly. refreshing is that? Um, so I guess uh, let's segue into film criticism. Because I'm curious about your thoughts on this, because I've spoken a lot about film criticism. Um, but what is uh, your thought on uh, film criticism of today? What I see is a lot of knee jerk reactions. I see not a lot of people, and, and sadly, and and you know, I know you used to used to work with media and stuff, and I don't mean to disparage anyone. I have a cousin who's a producer at CNN. No, um, I, I if anybody disparages it, it's me. Yeah, uh, yeah. I uh, I used to work uh, back then. It was called Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's called uh, Warner Brothers Discovery. And mm -hmm. um, I used to do uh, what was called electronic sales. Or, so I did a lot of digital work. So we would turn episodes of TV shows or movies into digital files that could be sent to Apple and Xbox and Sony and Amazon and all those places for for sale. Right. So that's what I did for a large portion of my time uh, at Turner. So. Um, I have lots of critiques. I also worked in t you know local TV news, so mm -hmm. I have a lot of thoughts on news and how news should be reported and right. how, how media is done. So, look, the, I I have my own <laughs> personal criticism, so I I have no I I welcome the criticism. Okay, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's not. It, I don't. I guess I don't want to say any one person, although you can certainly find you know those individuals. But you just see that there's a lot of knee jerk reactions. There's a lot of let me get this out. Let me get my thoughts out before I've fully digested what I've watched. Mm. You know, if something's not making money at the box office, it must be terrible. If it's making too much money, but we don't like it, it's not a good movie. They should have done it like this other person did it over here. And it's always amazing to me, like, especially with somebody like Zack Snyder. And I see it with Michael Bay, too. Like these filmmakers that... um have a certain uniqueness to the their style. Tim Burton probably gets the same kind of crap. It's like, what did you expect when you're going into this film? When you go see a Transformers like Part Five that Michael Bay has 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 done, are you expecting it to be different than Part Three <laughs> that you saw and didn't enjoy? You know, like like True. you know you know how Michael Bay is, and these films are making money. So somebody likes them somewhere. Oh, yeah. You know? And I'm not picking on Michael Bay because I he's had some films that I've thoroughly enjoyed before. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I just feel like there's a lot of shenanigans that go on with film criticism now that I don't know were always there. Maybe they were in a different way. Um, but you don't always feel like you're getting true, uh, that somebody's getting a true fair shake. I mean, you know, you go and you look at the Rotten Tomatoes score for, which I know you have, especially on this <laughs> channel for BBS. Or, you know, even even uh, Rebel Moon or, you know, whatever it is. And it, it's just absurd 
that something that was well made, you can you could talk about the story, you could talk about whatever, but something that was pulled together and made as a film is ranked so low than some of these other like it, the, I guess the ranking system, especially Rotten Tomatoes. I, I've never been a fan of the way it's done. I've always thought it was um, hot garbage and um, probably like you know paid off behind the scenes some way or another there is some of that there's there's documentation of some of that happening so yeah that's a real thing so i i I feel like you can maybe you could find a film critic you could trust out there you know honestly there's people on youtube that probably do it better than the ones in the papers or uh on rotten tomato you know it's at you know, but then there's there's also those folks too who are those are the kind of the folks I was talking about where they're in their car, they had just seen it. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. know, they're telling you how terrible it is, or they're t- you know, whatever it is. And it's it, to me, that's a film is something it's it's like art. I mean, it is art, but it's it's like it's like when you paint a picture. It's like when somebody paints a picture. Do you look at it once and go, Oh, it's crap? Or do you sit there and you look and you you know, you you kind of move your chair around. You know, this is this is what art historians and art critics do. They don't just look at something for a few minutes and just write it off completely. You know, and I and I feel like things should be revisited. I have a I have a show I do with Steve Gloss and and um, Geek Out Loud uh, podcasting on his Patreon, where we watch films that maybe weren't as popular the first time around and and we either say, you know, there's something here that could be worth revisiting. Or sometimes we go, "Mm, you know, maybe, maybe that didn't quite hit the spot that was supposed to, but we always have fun with it. And there's so many movies I feel like that are out there, you know, and we're talking about Zack Snyder, you know, sucker punch was one of those I watched. That was probably one of the last movies I saw by him before army of the dead had come out. I, I didn't see sucker punch when it came out. Somehow I missed, I, I don't even remember like much. I remember them announcing it and I saw a teaser trailer and I thought it looked pretty good. Um, But somehow I just, I don't remember what was going on in my life, but I missed (laughs) that whole section of that. And I watched it. I think it was right before army of the dead came out and it was the last kind of holdout of his film I hadn't seen. And I just, I remember people just hated it. Oh, he's such a misogynist and just all this kind of just nonsense. And I was just like, are you not watching what I'm watching? Like, (laughs) He's critiquing that stuff. Yeah. That is a complex movie. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I know he's not fully happy with the version we saw, he being Zack Snyder. So I, I'll do, cham- I will gladly champion to see a Snyder cut, so to speak, of that. Yeah, yeah. To see what's there. But I do feel like you had some great performances in that movie. Oscar Isaacs, gosh, what a, I mean, here's a guy that you see in one movie and he's like a hero. He's like a, he's the protagonist. You know, I just seen, well, I saw Dune, I saw Dune part one back when it came out, but I watched it again with my wife so she'd go see part two with me. And he's such a stoic and like honorable character who meets a tragic end, sadly. But to see him in that and then to see him and to think back in Sucker Punch at how just scummy he, he was. He, he, you know? Yeah, scummy is a good way to put it. I was yeah. thinking something probably much more severe. So <laughs> scum, scum, scummy is a good way to put that. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's a great actor. And I think being able to pull off that kind of part is very hard because yeah. you have to be okay with being the scummy kid. You do. Yeah. 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 But I mean, there's just some great performances in there from some underrated actresses. Is it Jenna Malone? I believe yes. she's in a lot of his stuff. Yep, yep. She's she's incredible in it. I, I just I feel like there's something there. It's worth revisiting and and to to have some. Unfortunately, there are people that go to Rotten Tomatoes and say, "Oh, Zack Snyder's you know 21 percent for Rebel Moon or 28 percent for BVS," which is just, I mean, that is like a tra- that's almost a national tragedy, right? There. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like terrible. to me, in my opinion, I mean, you know, and I forgot what what Sucker Punch had, but it wasn't great i just feel like film criticism in general you see it across the board you know even if it's something they really love a lot of times you're reading it and you're like this sounds phony like this sounds canned or something this sounds like a canned response um you can usually tell when something's like you you know you see somebody review something like joaquin phoenix's joker and nobody was expecting it to be what it was as far as money and success and all that. And you can see people's genuine reaction to like, wow, this, 
this movie made me think, or this movie really did this well and this well and this well. Then you see them say, oh man, this Captain America Civil War was just so good. And I was just like, it's the plot of BBS. Yeah. But, but I mean, you know, I know they came out the same year. I'm yeah. not, a, I'm not accusing anybody of like, something was just, a little weird with that. I think something though. was a little, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that like this was okay, but like this wasn't okay. Like it's the execution though, Dave. It's, hmm. Whatever that means. Yeah, whatever that it, means. <laughs> it's the execution could have been better. Yeah, I'm not impressed with film criticism now. I, I like to read old old movie critics, you know, when they're talking about like when The Godfather came out or when The Deer mm. Hunter came out or something like that or Apocalypse Now, you know, I, I like to hear I like to hear people talking about stuff like that and I'll go back and find like audio clips of Roger Ebert especially talking about film and you know, they're I'm not saying he always hit it out of the park, but I'm just saying that there's something a little more genuine about that style than what we get now, which is faceless people, you know, that may or may not actually exist putting reviews up online. That's true. How do we know they exist? It could be now it could be AI generated movie reviews. Exactly. We got to be exactly. careful about this. <laughs> if you could fix something about film criticism, given that you say that like you've you've read some reviews from the past and how maybe it was done uh a while ago is there something from there that you would want to pull in would it be the the authenticity that you would want to bring into it or is there something else that you think if i could have my way i could fix film criticism by doing this yeah, I mean, I, I I guess I wouldn't be so bold as to say I could fix it, but you know, I do <laughs> I do feel like the authenticity in your perfect thing, world, right? In my perfect world, I mean, I would probably um, maybe have an initial reaction to a film, and then maybe uh, you know take a breath and then revisit it at some point, mm. and and like have that be your definitive review of something. And I know we live in a fast paced world now, but I, I just feel like art, especially, is one of those things. So think about it. And, I, you know, nobody I'm about to age myself really bad. But, you know, Pearl Jam is about to come out with a new album. Right. So I'm going to buy oh, this. Pearl album. Jam. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to buy this album. Right. And I'm going to listen to the 12 to 14 songs, whatever. And some of them may hit me right away. And some of them in two or three months, I may go, oh, my gosh, that's a really good song. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's not I don't think it's anything I'm doing necessarily. I just think art sometimes takes a while to soak. Or to marinate, you know, I think you have to marinate on things like this. You know, I just saw it recently when I saw Argyle, which Henry Cavill was in. Um, I, I, I still want to see that. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. People just trashed it. I'm not saying it changes the world. <laughs> like, <laughs> not you know every film I mean? has to. Yeah. Right. That's, I guess that's what I'm saying. It's like everybody wants something to be something it's not instead of something it, it is or it's trying to be. And I think it's hard to compare Justice League Snyder Cut to... Avengers Endgame. I think it's incredibly hard to fairly compare those two. Marvel has a formula they worked on to get to that point, and it was very successful for them. And I feel like Zack Snyder is trying to do something different with his universe. Now, you can agree with it or not based on your choices or, or based on your preferences, excuse me, but you got to respect his choices in the sense that it can't be something than other what it than what it was going to be. You have to take it on its own merit. You can't yeah. uh, 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 have put expectations on something that is not fair for that thing. Um, yeah. And I would echo your sentiment to rewatch something. I've had several films where the first time I watched it, I was like, Ugh, I don't know yeah. about this. And then that second time was like, oh, this might be one of my favorite movies now. Absolutely. Like, that has happened to me several times. It happened to me with uh, Ricky Bobby, uh, mm. Talladega Nights, The Legend <laughs> of Ricky Bobby. First time I saw that, I was like... <laughs> and then I love it now. I love mm -hmm. it. Um, it also happened with, for me, uh, Romeo and Michelle's High School Reunion. The first oh, time yeah. I was like, I don't know about this thing. Right. And then I saw it for what it was that second time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know what to think of it at first. And then that second time I was like, I see what this is now. And yeah. it's so funny. Cause I recently went to Pensacon. It's this convention in Pensacola, Florida yeah. and Mira Sorvino was there I and, saw I that had, picture. and I had enough money to where I could go up and like get a picture with her and an autograph. That's awesome. I went up there and I was actually really excited about it. Cause I, now I love Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion. It is, <laughs> it is one of my favorite movies. 
And um, she had to like before, like she I had seen her at the, her table. I was like, oh, I should go by like a like a CVS or somewhere and get some post-it notes so she can sign the post-it note. Because mm -hmm. like the whole thing is like Romy and Michelle go to their high school reunion and they right. pretend that they invented post-it notes so that they could be famous at the high school reunion. Because <laughs> they're like, nobody knows who invented post-it notes. Maybe we did invent post-it notes. And then when I went up to the table, she already had post-it notes at the oh. table that she was autographing for people. And I was like, this is this is the greatest. That's perfect. And uh, she was like, do you want me to write uh, You're the Mary? Because that's a thing from the movie. And I was like, oh, my gosh, would you please write that I am the Mary? That would make <laughs> my day. So all that to say, I am a firm believer in the fact that you could maybe hate a movie the first time. And then the second time, you're like, let me give this another chance, see what it is. And it could be drastically different. Yeah. So I think there is value in revisiting something. Um, yeah. Now, there are some movies, like there is one movie that I will, well, maybe a couple of movies that I'm never going to rewatch. I'm never going to rewatch Thor 2 The Dark World. I'm never going to rewatch uh, Jurassic Park 2 The Lost World. Maybe it's just movie titles that have world in it have not really been <laughs> great for me. And then Artificial Intelligence, uh, the mm. uh, originally Stanley Kubrick, but like I think mm -hmm. uh, Steven Spielberg, Spielberg finished it up. Mm -hmm. Those are the only three movies I'm like. Only if I have added hours to my life will I rewatch those. But on a whole, <laughs> on a whole, I'm a firm believer in rewatching movies and giving them another shot. Um, yeah. And at least at least watching movies twice before you review them. I think that's fair um, because you might have missed something the first time. Yeah, um, absolutely. It could, it could be user error. That's what I always think about myself. And, and so I think um, I think that's a really, really good um, suggestion. You know, I'll never forget. I think it was during the pandemic when Zack Snyder was doing the watch alongs. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, BVS and Man of Steel. And uh, he pulled up uh, BVS and it said the Rotten Tom Tomatoes score. And he was just like, oh, 28. That's 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 not very nice. Or I forgot <laughs> how he put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I could still tell. And I'm not <clears throat> I don't think I'm speaking for him here, but it was just me visually watch it because you. <clears throat> One of the things was the camera was always on him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I guess he legally couldn't show the, the, the movie. movie or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. But I could kind of tell it, it irked him a little bit. And, and of right, course, I yeah. Mean, you know, I think 28's really low. It's too low for like that Like extreme, movie. like almost ridiculously low. Just putting numbers on stuff anyway and, and trying to quantify it is in my opinion, a little silly for art criticism. Uh, but that is just me. So um, just to get your point on film criticism and how, because you talk about how you're, you're doing that Patreon stuff or you're revisiting the movies and you've done mm -hmm. some podcasting. We've been on a panel together where we've uh, analyzed films. So how do you, when you sit down and watch a movie, how are you judging it? Are you judging it at all? Um, I think the first time, especially I try to just let it suck me away. Like just bring me into what it is and go along with it and be part of that world. You know, I, I do the same thing when I'm reading, whether I'm reading, you know, a James Bond novel or the Bible or whatever it is. I, I, I kind of become part of that world in a way when I'm reading something, that's just how I kind of make sense of what's going on. And I think if a movie can successfully pull you into the, into their world as you're watching it, I think a lot of times you're a lot more forgiven, forgiving of things than you would be if you're like, all right, I got to take notes. I got to, you know, what is this? What, wait, wait a minute. Why did that CGI look like crap? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's amazing how like you can, if you're into something, I mean, I was thinking about this when I was watching that flash Gordon the other day, like, you know, not, not, um, you know, it was a movie of its time and it was corny and cheesy and the costumes were over the top, ridiculous. Everything was supposed to be. However, you know, you look at it through 2024 20, eyes and it's like, wow, like what is, you know, I can't even imagine trying to show that to my daughter. You know, she'd just be like, what is this? You know, it's like a fever dream. <laughs> but you just, to me, you have to, the story was sucking me in and I, I was so forgiving of what was going on around it that i was just like this is such a fun this is kind of my i'm homesick for the yeah. day in the bed movie i'm gonna just put on you know so I, I i feel like you have to be kind of willing to let yourself be submerged in the world that's being shown to you and i feel like if you don't do that then you might be doing yourself a disservice and maybe whoever's listening to you if you're a critic you know you're doing them a disservice too i mean you know this the thing steve and i do 
a lot of times we'll talk about the background of what's going on in the movies behind the scenes. You know, um, originally this movie was supposed to be directed by so and so, you know, and and we also like go off on tangents about things like, oh, look, there's so and so out of this movie and stuff like that. It's amazing sometimes we catch ourselves not saying much and and we'll go, man, we're just sucked into this movie right now. <laughs> <And> just like, <laughs> That's you know, good. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that things deserve more than one viewing, certainly. I mean, maybe many more, you know, and you know, I was talking about Man of Steel earlier. I've watched it so many times, you know, watched Watchmen several times, you know, it's, it's these films deserve, I think, because art is important to the, to what's going on, what's going on in our world. Oh yeah. And I think there's things from all of these movies and, and Rebel Moon too, that you can pull and apply to something that's going on. Maybe. You know, and yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't want to like a movie to preach to me, but something that has universal, uh, meaning in terms of exactly. like, uh, human value and, um, uh, just if, if you can like not, not have like a preachy message, but like a, like a life lesson or like a, like a moral to it, right. um, I think is, uh, it usually helps me come up with like those 80, 80s movies, Back in the day, like even Stand By Me, where those little boys, I, I say little boys, but they're teenagers, they're looking mm -hmm. for a dead body. There's a, yeah. they learn some lessons and some morals out of that journey. And, and there's um, a, and there's a bad guy and a good, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's your white, there's your white hat and your black hat. Yeah. You know, if you're thinking in Western terms, yeah. There's your good guy and your bad guy. It's, it's, yeah. So I think, you know. I think you can um, pull things from some of these movies that can, uh, like help you sometimes be a better person or help mm -hmm. you see the world in a, a new light. So I think those are usually, I'm in, I, I think we probably talked about this a little bit before, but like you can find meaning in something. If you can yes. find for me, if you can find, if I can find meaning in something, I usually am more attached to it. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's a, a good way to, to look at that in terms of like when you're rewatching something, is there, is there something here I can kind of grab hold of? If you look at Army of the Dead, like Scott Ward's love for his daughter. I mean, oh, that's like a whole yeah. part of that movie that doesn't really get talked about. Because and you it's know. I, in my opinion, that's like the whole crux of the movie. That's yeah. that is the movie. It's not yeah. the zombies. It's right. It's the right. father daughter relationship. Right. For the, sure. the, the zombies are just the dressing. Yeah. You know, like you know the that's meat just and potatoes. The, bo is, the bonus stuff. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Yeah. So. Um, I hope you are able to watch not to put ideas in your, your head, but I hope you're able to watch that as a father, um, to, to, to be able to sort of understand that they're good, e even though kind of everybody in that movie, I think dies except for her, except for the yeah. daughter. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, he does not make it at the end, but it's a zombie movie. So most people well, die in zombie movies. Yeah. And you know, the, the, I, just to, just to really put that movie over is something wild and just totally just bonkers, but like in a good way. Um, you know, there's the scene where they're in the bank vault and they see their clothes on these bodies. So it's like oh, this, yeah. this kind of time warp thing going on. I mean, I, I think that's what I loved about the movie so much is that it was just so bizarre, just bonkers and just crazy. And just, you know, there's, there's robot zombies. I mean, there's, <laughs> you know, there's a UFO in one shot and there's just all this kind of just stuff, you know, and evidently there's some connection between it and rebel moon. I, that's, I that's what I'm wondering about because I was about to say, like, I want to follow up to army of the dead because of that, mm -hmm. because there are so many uh, unanswered questions. So yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get some sort of connection, connecting point between the two franchises yeah i mean as 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 rough as losing the snyderverse was for folks like you and me who enjoyed it i do just have really enjoyed his netflix era so far it's just been so much fun i mean even even the spinoff movie i know he just executive produced it but the army of thieves movie that was um, great pre prequel it's just incredible he's built yeah. a whole universe here of something that i don't necessarily love like you were talking about zombies you know i'm not just like a zombie fiend it's like yeah yeah I'll, I'll watch a good movie though, you know? So, um, I do love, I think I'm enjoying the fact that he's getting to do his own IP. We didn't talk about it, but the, um, 
I can't remember the name of it now off the top of my head, but the animated movie he did. Um, oh, the uh, Legends of the Guardians. Yes, Are you thank you. About that? The, the owl, yeah. the owl movie is kind the of owl what, movie, I, yeah. what I what I call it for short. The the yes. uh, the owls of Gahul. Yes, owls of Gahul. Yeah, my we watched that with my daughter and and my wife and I had watched it previously and we we loved it. We enjoyed it so much, and it's like, you know, is it. Is it um, his best work? Maybe not. But at the same time, it's an animated movie. He's trying different things. Um, I don't think you're ever going to get shortchanged with a Zack Snyder movie. You may not appreciate choices he makes in the story or or whatever it is, slow-mo or whatever it is people complain about. But I don't think you're going to get somebody who's just going to rest on his lawyer, laurels film after film, you know? You're going to get somebody who's going to push those boundaries. Yeah, he's going to give it 100%. I think that movie is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Incredible animation. Not a lot of people talk about it when they talk about Zack Snyder, but it is artistically very good. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so I think maybe I should also do a uh, Legend of the Guardians, uh, something rather for my YouTube channel. So we're, we're just going to have please. to really... We're just going to have to really dive into the filmography. Um, so I may I may pull you into to some of this stuff. I don't know. I'm going to see if uh, Dave's got, <laughs> got some time. Um, but I guess in the last question, I'm going to ask everybody this question because I'm very I'm trying to find the answer for myself. And so maybe somebody has the answer for me. What is your definition of art? If you had to explain art to somebody, what would you tell them? Oh, my gosh. Um like just in a shot, like like what he's talking about, like oh no, just like uh, art as a concept. Just like, in my mind, yeah, what art yeah, is? Yeah, what what do you think of when you think of art? I think it's freedom. I think it's expression. I think it's like timeless expression and freedom. Like if that makes sense. I mean, you know, one of the things we have in this country is our freedom of speech, and I think art plays a huge role in that whether we take it for granted or not so many people are blessed you know with this talent that i don't have with you know drawing or musical talent you know and where in, in in filmmaking you know we're talking about Zack snyder and you know and where does it come from well you could say yeah the person works really hard but that I think it comes there's somewhere else that it's coming from. There's something cosmic or eternal about it. It's almost like they reach into the abstract and they make art for us. So to me, it's 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 about that having that freedom um, that we have for that expression, if that makes sense. I hope that wasn't corny. I love that so much, Dave, <laughs> um, because when when you know just mentioning the word freedom, like I think about some of those you know, like Van Gogh and some of these mm -hmm. painters who like had, they had the freedom. Mm -hmm. They didn't, I, I, to take this literally, like some of those painters could sit in front of a landscape. They didn't have to worry about a nine to five job. They right. didn't have to like, they didn't have schedules they had to fill. They could just sit there and admire the nature, the world around them, and they could paint it and, yeah. and, and express it back onto a canvas. And uh, to take that literally, I think there is something freeing about the ability to have the time to create something. But then to talk about it in sort of a more metaphorical sense, um, the freedom in terms of not having constraints put on you, yes, not having um, somebody tell you what you can or cannot create. If you have an idea and you want to make that thing, go make that thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a really cool way to look at art. So I, I don't think it's corny or cheesy at all. And um, I think uh, what you do with your uh, ability to analyze films and talk about them in a meaningful, thoughtful, um, and honest way, I think is a talent of its own. Because as we, ha as we have discussed, mm -hmm. not a lot of people do it well. So, um, <laughs> so I always admire people who can talk. I think, me personally, I think there is an art form to film criticism. Mm. I think it's, I think it's an art form in itself because if you are, are somebody who can really do it well and take it seriously, you can pull out that artistic freedom from the creator. You can say, this person presented this in front of me and I see what they're saying. 
I think I know what they're trying to communicate. And people who do that well are so important. And so I really appreciate the fact that you are still doing it and that you are still um, out there talking about films. I think that is so valuable because uh, in my BBS research about film criticism, I started to realize that bad film critics make bad movies. Yeah. <laughs> bad film reviews, bad, bad movie reviews will indicate that bad movies will keep mm -hmm. being made. Mm -hmm. And so people who That's can exactly review, right. people who can review movies well and take them at least seriously and give them a fair shot can only inspire filmmakers to be better and make better films. So yeah. I really am glad to hear that you're still doing that. And I really appreciate your time with me to talk about these things and what well, maybe we'll have to do this again. And, uh, I, I would love to maybe do a series with you on Back to the Future because uh, right. I, I don't ever get Anytime, to talk Rebecca. about it. So, so maybe, you know, maybe God bless you. Thank you for having me on here. It's incredible. I love pretty much all you do. I mean, I, I'm a big Supergirl radio fan, and of course you've had me on there and stuff. And it's the, you know talking about something like this with someone who's a friend too is just incredible. So thank you so much, and I do consider you a friend. So thank oh, you me so too. Much. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we'll we'll have to do it again and uh, continuing to practice that art of film criticism Absolutely. in the future.